Welcome to episode 53 of the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram, and today's topic, Magic in Gardul. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. Welcome back. And let's get right into today's topic, one of my favorites. I've spent way too much time thinking about magic in my world, and there's some different approaches. Not so much that they've never been done before. However, the way it works in my world, I think is different than what I've seen in anyone else's in its entirety. So, what is magic in the universe in Gardul? And this is sort of, I think, from what I've read or seen or listened to, for me, I think of magic, it's sort of the dark matter in my universe. It's this thing that we know is there in today's science. We, we can measure its effect on the universe, but we can't explain it. It's not so much your in, insufficiently explained advanced technology. It is something that connects the universe together. It connects life and inanimate objects together on Earth. It helps create consciousnesses. I don't know exactly at that level everything about magic in my world. But it's this idea that there is everything is interconnected through it, I do know. And, and that is sort of a key for magic in my world. Like I said, it's the cosmic stream... Uh, is the cosmic strings and the dark matter of the universe. Now, to understand, it's probably best to talk about how is magic a- accessed in my world. And it's over a spectrum. As everyone knows, I love my spectrums. At one end of the spectrum is extra magical. And extra magical is, uh, you might think of shamanism or people who pray to God or gods uh, to do their bidding. That is extra magical. The person themselves cannot cause the effect that they're trying to generate. So they are going beyond themselves to do it. Now, the neat thing with extra magical magic is not everyone needs an ability to do that. Certain types of abilities, like being able to channel spirits or being a medium so you can speak to spirits, might help. So there are things that can make people better at this and more effective at doing it. But it's really this idea that you have rituals, which might or might not involve locations, i.e. holy spots or going to churches that have been sanctified. And they take time. They're not quick. This isn't Gandalf doesn't, you know, ask for a spirit's help and summon a fireball and shoot at someone, which he never did that anyway. But if he wanted to summon your classic fireball spell through spirit magic, it would take a lot longer to do, and it probably wouldn't be quite the way he wanted. And another thing is, it's not just about gods. So it's not just praying to gods or a pantheon of gods. There could be river spirits or ancestor spirits. Anything that there is a consciousness to in my world is a spirit. And those spirits can be, are all metaphysical, and there could even be other dimensional uh, beings access this way too. Um, but it's this idea that the person doing it, you know, it could just be like, oh, grandfather, could you really help me through this tough job today? And metaphysical being, a spirit or a god or something, if they hear that and it's done in a way that pleases them, they might help. Now, through rituals and locations and times, you can help increase the likelihood of them helping. But they might help if you just ask. Some rituals could be very quick, like the whole Christian prayer thing. I pray to God for help, and God helps or does not help me. In the context of Gardul, would be extra magical. Innate magic. To me, innate magic are usually beings. There are like spirits, or you might think of fairies as extra magical. Dragons in my world are completely magical. Uh, there's a thing called true giants uh, or greater giants. Uh, they are also very magical beings. 
And they interact with magic at the most basic level. They can think it, they can speak it, and their actions cause it. And nothing else can do that. Um, but they're at one far extreme. And then at the other extreme is extra magical where the people who get the benefits from it might not actually know anything about how to themselves connect to magic in the universe outside of their innate connection to it, which it's probably not using the word innate for that because it's not, you might get those two things confused since they call this innate magic. But it's really the idea of if a being thinks that you're a jerk or they tell you you're a jerk or they slap you because you're a jerk, you become a jerk. That would be innate magic. It's exceptionally powerful and exceptionally rare. There are costs to it. Those really aren't so important for what our discussion is today. And at some point, I'll probably talk more about, you know, how I determine the cost. But the initial limiter on innate magic is innate magic happens very rarely. Very few things have the ability to connect directly into the dark matter of my universe, into the cosmic streams of, streams of my universe. Not many things can do that. So that itself is a massively limiting feature of it. And causes weakness. And there's a third kind of magic I call learned magic. And this is people who figured out ways to tap into the magic of the universe. And they need a bit stronger of a connection to do this. This idea that they have magical energy in them. Um, sometimes called mana or it's essentially this pool of health that they have. And they can expend that health through time. They can expend that health to tap into magic and perform effects. Now, the reason I call it learn, though, is it's not innate. It's not anything they want to do. They go through a, a, a way of doing it, and the more ways they learn, the better they become at doing it. They can't just, anything they want to do, they can't just pull that off. It takes study, and it takes practice. These are sort of your more classic mages, especially if you're familiar with like Dungeons and Dragons, or if you're familiar with, Lord of the Rings, where they seem much more scholarly and a little bit less physical. And there's a few things that they have to deal with beyond the literally sacrificing their health to to perform magic. And one is you can reduce that cost upon you by time. So the longer you take to do something, uh, the, le- the less of a cost to you it is to perform. The more elaborate you shape so in a culture that is going to be in my first novel called the uh, the Drachm culture, what they do are they create uh, wooden sheets and they actually chisel out uh, the ruins. And then when it comes to casting the magic, the time has been spent and stored here and they break it and it it's a way for them to diffuse the cost and summon it. Summoning magic, and I don't mean it's like you're summoning a demon, but once you have the sh- the spell shaped, whether it's through words or it's through a device like the piece of wood that the bedrakens break in half, once you've shaped the magic, you can then summon the power to do it. And really, you're you're tapping in on a smaller scale magic that sort of lacerates through the world. And some parts of the world might have a little bit more and some probably have a little bit less. And they're probably like deserts in the world too where magic is so rare that it, it's harder to perform there. And depending on where you're at, all these things kind of go together to determine how tough it is to cast magic. But the summoning is, is really taking the energy through your body and through the shapes that you've created, whether they're verbal or they're mental if you're really good or they're through an item, sort of a stored spell, once they're broken, the magic happens. Now, there's a few other things to understand with Learn Magic too. Learn Magic, the interesting thing is if other people know how to do it, you can very easily connect with them and do more powerful things than you could on your own. Because now, if the person's as healthy as you are, it's twice the magic ability. So you you can Sacrifice up to that much health twice. Uh, human sacrifice, in theory, will add uh, power to uh, spells because you're you're extracting life force from something. It doesn't have to be life force that you're taking. 
but it's energy basically being filtered through the shapes that you've created. And also, there are ways too, which really haven't been developed so much in the time of these books, but magic, there are ways that you can tap into people who don't understand magic through just their existence. And sort of, you, you take a little bit of magic from them as they perform an action, a ritualistic action, like pulling the machine to stamp out bullets. That could be magically creating bullets. Now, you notice I didn't get into too much detail on what any of the things I said, like what are the rituals, what are the locations or the time time lengths it takes. Or magic is very influenced by culture. So the way magic is performed in Bedrakis, which is the homeland uh, or one of the areas that are occupied by the Bedrakum, those people uh, will perform magic different than someone from Shiftar or the Siren would, would. So there are different expressions of it, and it's very culturally biased. And perhaps the culture's way to interact might be from the types of spirits that live around them, especially if they're dealing with extra magical type of creatures. They might have certain types of things that they want or don't want, and certain things they respond to here but not there. Or if you do the thing that works in Bedrakum to summon a spirit somewhere else in the world, the spirit might actually do just the opposite of what you want. Because the problem with extra magical magic is it's a different consciousness you're interacting with. So it's easier for the consciousness to change or distort what you're trying to accomplish. And beyond cultural influence, there are also changes over time. The way the Bedrakum people started performing magic versus where they were in the Middle Ages versus where they were in the Industrial Age versus where they are in the Space Age are all different, which leads to this thing I like to call noun confusion. And noun confusion in my world is where you maybe don't call something magic, but it is. Billy's empathetic, so Billy must be a mage. Maybe. Maybe he can read expressions really well. Maybe he's tapping in magic, and maybe that's the only way he can tap into magic, but he is. So, there is now confusion. In my world, mages end up becoming the people who run corporations, because the ritualistic building of things is really magically producing items. And people don't think of it necessarily as magic, but it really is in the world of Gardul. The assembly line to make a car is a magical factory. And even though it might resemble exactly the same way it does on Earth, doesn't make it not magical. Just because people understand better what's happening, the changes in the metallurgy, and the more advanced they become at making cars, the more they understand about the science of metal, the more they think that they're in control of it, but it's really a magical process. So, industry would be confused with magic. So, it, it can lead to noun confusions in my world. And it's meant, meant to. Because the question is, if you see something happening, is it real or is it magic? Who knows? And does it really matter if it has the same effect on you? If a mage pulls out a sword and strikes me with it, does it make it any less painful? The answer is probably not. So whether that sword was constructed and, and you could really say there's no magic involved in it, or if it was completely constructed versus magic, if I get hit by that sword and it hurts me the same, I don't care. The rate for this episode is basic. This is, to me, a basic topic. You need to know the magic of your world, or if you're ever in my world, you need to know the magic of mine, but, you know, for the world builder task, it's the magic of your world. <laughs> or for the rating as well. Uh, or for the rating, it's the rating, you know, is based off of what is going to happen for you. Because you need to understand the way magic is performed, whether it's an extra magical thing, an innate thing, a learned thing, something else that you've come up with, or maybe you have a limited version where Sure, there's learned magic, but it's only this one specific way it works at all across the world. Or maybe through a culture. Or extra magical. Maybe that, only certain cultures can do that. and Maybe that's the only form of magic that exists. It's up to you as the person who creates the world. So it's a basic topic. And saying no, there's no magic in my world, even though it's a fantasy setting, would be the same thing as saying that there is magic and you just want to know that. So the world building task for the day is Create 
the rules for your magic. But one of the warnings I like to give people here when you're talking about something like magic, which especially the higher, what they call the higher fantasy realms, you know, the realms with more magic. What is the cost for performing the magic? If there's no cost, what prevents the people who know how to use it from just dominating everything? And maybe that's what the story you want to tell is how they dominate everything, in which case feel free not to limit it, but just understand that there is a price for not limiting something, especially when it gets as powerful as magic. The real world task for the day. Go. I have cats. I love cats. You maybe have a dog. You maybe don't have any pets. If you don't have any pets, you get the day off. But if you have pets, go find your pets, pet your pets, play with your pets. Whether or not you can set them part of your family, when you make the investment of the time, they need love and affection the same as, as people do. Or maybe it's just the warmth they want from you. Who cares what's in their mind? But a happy cat is a cat that is being treated the way it needs to be. So know your pet and treat it the way it needs to be. Now, if it's a fish, don't pet it. Let's stare at it for a little while. Interact with your pets. They're not just things that you own. They're things that are part of, that you've made part of your life. So treat them with due respect. The tease for this episode. Friday is going to be Flash Fiction Friday. My first Flash Fiction Friday, which is going to start a series of Flash Fictions. And this one will be called The Minotaur Wonderings. And the story will be Rise of the Mad Yarl. And there will be no actual Minotaurs in the story. Ultimately, the protagonist will be a Minotaur. And I did say protagonist. However, we're going to start with the rise of the antagonist with the rise of the Mad Yarl. And as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com for the show notes. It'll be under podcasting. World Builders Anvil. That's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you've just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike, why the myth rolls high.